Well, it's good to, to see you all, and uh, thank you for coming tonight. Um, we are a little bit different to some, some ministries. We, uh, we don't start our meetings with um, worship times and things um, like some do. It's not that we don't like worship. We do. But um, we've just, we just want to get straight into as much of the meat of things as we can. Um, one of the, um, the things that's been very important to me in my life has been to uh, take Jesus as the model or as the, the example for the way that we should live and walk our lives. And um, I just don't see uh, on the um, Mount of Olives um, that there was a worship team there. I, I'm, I, <laughs> I, I, <laughs> there's a lot of things that we do that I, I think, yes, they're wonderful and in the time and place. But that sort of part of the body of Christ is being done very, very well in other places, and uh, it's not a, it's not kind of a forte for us. Um, we're we're generally not um, musicians, but we we've come into for those of you who haven't had an experience of us before, we've come into a, into a realization of some things about Christianity that seem to be basic to us now but years ago weren't basic to us at all. And so we've, we've come to, to see that if we're to become like Jesus, um, then Jesus, you know, if you like, point 1A, if you want to talk about Jesus, point 1A would be that Jesus is the Son of God. I mean, that's, that's something that we'd all agree with and, and understand. And so if Jesus in his basic being, is a son, then surely for us, if we're to become like him, we have to come into that basic too, that we, are, that we begin to realize that our Christianity is to be based around being sons to a father. Um, and, uh, and our identity has largely been, in the, in the body of Christ, our identity has largely been that we are servants of the Lord, and uh, yes, we serve as Jesus served. Um, he served us. He still does. But he served as a son, not as a servant. Um, love always serves. When you love somebody, you'll, you'll find that you cannot but want to do the things that will bless them to try to fill their needs, whatever it is. You, if you truly love somebody, you, you lay your life down to try to help them, to, to give them everything that you can give to them. And so love serves, but we are not servants. In fact, Jesus said it very clearly to us. and He said, I no longer call you servants. In that case, in that time in the disciples' development, he said, I call you friends. And later on, um, after he had risen from the dead, he said to them, I'm going to my Father and to your Father, to my God and to your God. And again, he was taking it another step, saying, now, no longer are you even my friends anymore. You've become my brothers and sisters. We have the same Father. And uh, was introducing us to that. And... and um, you know, the understanding even of us being disciples has been changed to us. Um, I, I know we're all followers of Jesus, and we will always be followers of Jesus because we're, we're wanting to walk in His footsteps, and we're wanting to, to follow the way He lived His life. We want to follow who He is. We want to become like Him in every aspect. That's the focus of us. When you, when you love somebody, there's something in you wants to be like them, and you, your personalities kind of develop. I don't know if you've ever noticed people who've been married for many, many years um, in, a, in a, a tight, close, intimate love with, with each other, that um, they might even begin to start to look like each other. They, they can certainly start to even assimilate the same kinds of expressions. In fact, sometimes when they're talking, they will take half the sentence each. And, uh, and sometimes they both talk at the same time. And so it's kind of like they're both wanting to say the same thing. There's a oneness that comes um, in, in a love relationship. And, and love, of course, as someone said, the, the greatest form of flattery is, um, is to 
copy somebody, to, be, to, to try to be like them. If you really have somebody that you greatly admire in your life, um, a part of you wants to be like them. You, you'll start doing what they do. You'll start to try to become like them in some, in some ways. And so our, our walk as Christians, we've described it as, in one time we've described it as being servants of the Lord. Another, we've described it as being disciples of Jesus. And, uh, and a lot of our perspective of disciples, um, we, we've not really grasped fully what that means, but we know the word disciple means, or comes from the root word discipline. In other words, to, um, to modify your behavior purposely, um, to discipline yourself. And a lot of our understanding of what it means to be a disciple has become uh, focused on this issue of discipline, become a disciplined person, and it's been applied to us often in the sense that now that you are a disciple of Jesus, you have to discipline yourself, and the, and the focus of it has been you have to discipline yourself to do good things and to discipline yourself not to do bad things, to discipline yourself to, to walk a holy life and to discipline yourself to let go all whole unholy behavior and drop those things off. And a lot of our focus as disciples of Jesus and a lot of our focus as Christians in the, in the body of Christ, in the church, has been this focus on you need to learn to obey um, the commands of the Lord and discipline yourself to do what is right and discipline yourself not to do what is wrong. And so that has become, this, for many of us, the central issue of our Christianity is this word obedience and, uh, and the discipline to self-discipline yourself to behave correctly, to, to ha- behave morally right and to refuse immor- immoralities. I'm not talking about just sexual immorality, but all kinds of immoralities. Immorality with money, immorality with relationships, immorality with, with your work life, you know, cheating um, as far as, um, you know, theft or those kinds of things. We've got to live a, a high-level moral life. But you see, Jesus' disciples, we, we, the word we would use today if we talked about disciples, we would say students, and somebody, you know, you, you go to university as a student, you go to, to your college, high school, whatever it is. And, and the issue of discipline for us when it comes down to following somebody to learn from them, the discipline is that we need to turn up at the right time. I mean, discipline yourself to be at the lectures if it's university. Um, to be in the, in the college, to, to turn up at college at the right time, to be there for the classes, no matter what else you might prefer to do, you discipline yourself to be there at those lectures and to learn and to do the homework and to, uh, you know, to apply yourself to study and, um, and concentrate when the, when the lecturer is speaking. Um, and you discipline yourself to follow those actions, to, to learn. But you see, when you go to university, you don't learn discipline. You, you discipline yourself to be there, but what the university teaches you is not discipline. They, they perhaps teach you biology. Um, maybe they teach you um, advanced mathematics. Maybe they teach you engineering. Maybe they teach you architecture or, or they teach you the classics and the arts or whatever it is. You go to university not to learn discipline. You go to learn the subject that's being taught. But you have to discipline yourself to be there. And so when Jesus' disciples too were called disciples, they were, they were disciplined to go where he went. And, and I've, I've wondered at times, you know, I'm, I'm a person who loves, um, I like walking. Um, I've, uh, I think of, of probably my greatest joy in life is just simply walking. But uh, I will walk in beautiful places. You know? I like to walk along the mountain tops, and, and I, 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 I don't mind at all the sweat and the effort and the puffing and all of the things that go with mountains and outdoors. I don't mind that at all because I, I love just to walk. I once walked the length of New Zealand, 2,200 kilometers. I just love, like to walk. And, and, uh, um, and it, it takes a lot of effort to do that. And you see, I wondered how people felt, maybe, who didn't like to walk. 
when Jesus was here because he walked throughout the country and a lot of the time they were walking along the roads and, and they had to sleep beside the road somewhere or in uncomfortable places or wherever it was. They, they disciplined themselves to be with Jesus. I, I imagine he was very fit um, and, and probably physically quite strong having been a carpenter and not everybody perhaps would fit into that kind of thing right Nia? <laughs> not everybody would perhaps want to be but it would be a matter of discipline because they want to hear what he has to say not because they love to be disciplined and made to walk down the road hour after hour in the heats of the day heat of the day and so our understanding of discipleship I believe has has uh, we've been a bit misled that discipleship is about learning how to live a disciplined life because, see, the issue is Jesus didn't teach discipline. If you walked with Jesus, what would he have taught you? What would you have seen in him? What, what would you have observed about his life? What would he have revealed to you? What would he have shown you? What would you have noticed about Jesus' life if you were walking with him. See, that's what he taught his disciples and what his whole focus for them was as they followed him, as they were his followers, disciples, as they disciplined themselves to be with him, what he actually taught them was this. He taught them how to relate to God as a son. He taught them how to see God as a father. That was the, the probably the greatest I don't know, contention that the religious leaders of the day had about this Jesus was that he called Yahweh Papa. And it was such a huge offense to so many because this is Almighty God. This is the one whose name you're not even allowed to say in that day. You weren't allowed to pronounce the word Yahweh. You, you, uh, you weren't allowed to write it except you had a privileged place of doing that. It was, a, it was such a holy name. And Jesus goes and changes this name Yahweh, if you like. He presents it to them that, to me, Yahweh is Papa. He's my dad. I remember one time some years ago speaking in a, in a fairly large conference. And, um, and uh, after I'd spoken one time something like what I'm saying now about God being our Papa... And it offended the leaders of the conference intensely. And one of them in the next session was in a different language that I didn't understand. But friends of mine told me that in the next session, the first thing he said when he got up is, we do not call God Father, Papa. He is Almighty God. And we must relate to him as Almighty God. See, Jesus came in and broke right through that. And he taught the disciples, he said, when you pray, say, our Father, my Father. When you pray, go into a closet and speak to your Father in private, he said. And you see, we, we, have, we, have, we have missed so much of what the gospel is actually talking about, what the disciples tried to teach us, what Jesus spoke from, the words he said. He was t telling us, I want you, when he said, Say, our Father, when you pray, go into your closet and speak to your Father in private, and your Father will reward you openly. What he was saying is, I want you to relate to God as your Father and speak to him in intimate terms of Papa. His words were Abba, which in much of our language would be Papa, or, or in some cases even Dad or Daddy. He said, relate to him in an intimacy of sons and daughters to a father who loves you intensely. And see, our Christianity has become so formalized, and even to one point where we sometimes relate so much just to Jesus um, that we, we omit an, an intimacy with a father at all. But we're living in a day today in the body of Christ where God is beginning to reveal himself to us as Father. And he's beginning to not just tell us that he loves us, but he's beginning to open his heart that we can experience being loved by him. 
that his love goes deeply into our hearts as a substance, like as Paul writes, that the love of God be poured out into our hearts, not knowing that he loves us, experiencing being loved by him. And my father, in the end of his life, in the last time I saw him, he said to me for the first time in my life, I love you, son. First time in my life. I think I was um, 51. I love you, son. Never. I wish he had have been able to give me some inclination earlier. <laughs> I, I wish he could have put his hand on my shoulder one day and, and me be able to experience what it was to be loved by my father. But I never, I never knew that. I never saw a loving look. I never saw an affectionate touch. I never had any physical impartation or sense of feeling loved by him. And I think it's true for many of us. And because it's true for many of us, what happens is when we hear that God is a father, if we have never experienced our own father loving us, we find it hard to expect that any father could love us. Because our experience of the word father means not being loved by that person, not experiencing affection from that person. And so when we hear that God is Father, we can have the same kind of reaction. We don't expect to be loved by Him. But we have been loved by friends and even by our brothers and sisters. And so when Jesus comes to us as a friend and as a brother, the Bible says, we can believe that He loves us because we have seen love in friends, in, uh, in um, people that are around our own age, by our own brothers and sisters, maybe in occasion times when we, we just know that they felt compassion for us, maybe when they've seen us suffering, and we can understand that they do get touched by the feelings of our troubles, and they do have some love for us, some affection for us. And so when we hear that Jesus loves us, we can open our hearts to experience that love from Jesus. Believe that he loves us. But when it comes to the Father, it's, it can be hard for us to believe that, our Father, that God the Father could love us because he's a father and our earthly fathers didn't love us. We weren't able to express, I should say, affection to us. And so we never experienced or saw love in their eyes, in their habits, in their touch, and the way they treated us. In the body of Christ today, God is beginning to open the doorway of his own heart to reveal to us his Father's love for us. There's a scripture in John chapter 1 talking about Jesus. And it talks about us as the human race too. It's a simple verse in verse 18. It says very simply this. It says, No one has seen God at any time. The only begotten Son who is in the bosom of the Father, he has revealed him. It's talking about Jesus. The only begotten Son who is in the bosom of the Father. In other words, who abides in the heart and in the love of the Father. Who experiences the heart of the Father continuously. The only begotten Son who is in the heart of the Father. He has revealed Him. And you see, the only person who can reveal somebody what somebody is like is someone who loves that person. And can show us what they're really like. And Jesus came, and in his life to us, he revealed exactly what the Father is like because he lived, he, he, he resided, he dwelt. He, he was continuously immersed in the experiencing of the Father's love for him. And because he was in that place of the Father's love for him, when the disciples walked with him, they experienced somebody who was living in the continuous experience of Yahweh loving them as a father. That's what impacted the disciples. One of the things I think we don't realize is the reason why the disciples followed Jesus wasn't because of the wonderful things he said or even of the miracles that he did. He, I mean, those, those things impressed them, no doubt. But when it finally came down to it, the one thing that they were following him for, because at one stage he said some things that were very hard for them to receive, and many of Jesus' disciples left, and Jesus turned to the 12, the close ones, and he said, are you guys going to leave me too? And they said, well, where can we go? You alone 
have the words of eternal life. You, you alone connect us to Yahweh. You have a spirituality about you. Something is real about you as a person. We know that you have a hotline to heaven. We know that you're connected to Yahweh. We, we cannot deny that there's something about you that we know you're connected to God, and it's Him that we want. We want to be connected to Him. They couldn't figure out if Jesus was a teacher, if he was a miracle worker, if he was a prophet. They couldn't figure out what he was. I think they probably saw the compassion in him like they'd seen in Jeremiah or heard of in Jer about Jeremiah. They'd probably seen the harshness and the strength that they'd heard about in Elijah, who said his forehead was like flint. You know, he, he just spoke the most straight, I don't know, black and white truth to people who were in high places of religious authority, and he just spoke it as it was to them. He wasn't afraid of them. And so they think, he's like Elijah. They thought maybe he's like David. He seems to have this kind of warrior spirit. He's, he's, he's not afraid to do battle. He makes a whip and he chases all of these false priests and false men and women of God out of the temple. He actually made a whip. <laughs> it always amuses me. Imagine they're sitting around the fire one night, they're on their way to Jerusalem perhaps, and Jesus is sitting down cutting strips of leather and plaiting them together, and slowly they realize he's making a whip. I mean, what on earth is he making a whip for? This is gentle Jesus, meek and mild, isn't it? Isn't he the one that's always nice to everybody? <laughs> isn't he the one that's always, you know, just um, you know, full of compassion and love and gentleness and kindness and etc.? But he's making a whip. Next day they find out what it's for. He's carrying it to the temple. He chases all these people out who have turned the temple into a place of trade, where it's supposed to be a place of gift. So they're following this Jesus. And they say, where can we go? You're the only one that has the words of eternal life. We don't understand a lot of the things you say, but we're going to stick with you because you are connected to Yahweh, it's unmistakable. Nobody could do the miracles that you do except God be with them. And you're doing these things. And we want to stick with you because we want to know Yahweh like you do. We want to experience Yahweh, they were saying in Jesus. And they did. Jesus has always been the door to the revelation of the Father. The Bible says he is the exact image of the invisible God. He is the complete and perfect representation of God the Father. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians, it says, in the face of Jesus Christ, we see the glory of God. In other words, we see the reality of God Almighty. We see the reality of the Father when we look at the face of Jesus. And that's been the whole purpose of Jesus' life all the way through. He is the mediator between God and man. He is to bring us to the Father. He said, no one comes to the Father but by me. I remember Derek Prince speaking about that verse one time. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. The words of Jesus. Derek Prince said, that verse speaks about a pathway and a destination. Jesus is the way, the Father is the destination. And then he made this statement. He said, the problem in most of the church worldwide is this. We've got stuck on the way. We haven't got to the top of the mountain. We've only walked halfway up. We haven't got to the point of being a follower of Jesus. We haven't realized the goal of following Jesus. We haven't realized the, 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 uh, the culmination of the purpose of God in sending Jesus here. Certainly Jesus came to, to take away our sins, to wash away the sins of the world. He came to cleanse our consciences. He came to open the doorway to the Father. But for most of us, most of the body of Christ today, but it's changing, we've got stuck and seen Jesus and almost Jesus only. Whereas Jesus came to open the doorway to the Father and bring us home. We've lived in a restlessness instead of rest. Because the goal has always been the heart of the Father for us. So I just wanted to say that to start. Because we're, we're in a new day. 
we're, we're in a day to day where things are becoming possible in the body of Christ in a way that we have not understood for a couple of thousand years. The disciples understood it perfectly. It's written there in the New Testament, as absolutely clear as you can get it. But we've missed so much of what the Lord has been wanting to bring us into. And Christianity, for so many of us, has been all around basically one word, obedience. If you're to be a Christian, you are to learn to be obedient. Obedient to God, to do whatever God asks of you and tells you. And so we've turned it into this servant-master relationship where living a good Christian life is hearing what God wants you to do and being obedient and doing that. <laughs> the interesting thing about the word obedience, I remember when I was a little boy and I get sick sometimes, my mother used to come to me with a little bottle of medicine and a, a tablespoon. And she'd open the bottle top and I'd smell what was in the bottle. It was castor oil. I don't know if any of you ever remember castor oil. It was something that was supposed to fix your stomach. And she'd put it in the spoon. It was the most horrible tasting thing that you can possibly imagine. And my mother used to come, because it was my mother, if it had been my father or anybody else in the world, I would not have opened my mouth. <laughs> but she'd say to me, fill the spoon up right to the brim and say, open your mouth. And because it was my mum, I would be obedient and open my mouth. And she poured this horrible stuff down my throat, which I could taste, I could taste it for days. I remember many years later, I came across a bottle of castor oil, and I, I thought it can't have been as bad as I remember. By this time, I was in my mid-30s or something, and I, and I remember I just got a fork, and I dipped the fork into the castor oil, just a very little bit of it hanging on the fork, you know, um, points of the fork, and just dipped it in very little bit, and put it in my, oh, awful, awful, awful stuff. You see, your only, obedience is only a relevant word when you do not want to do what's being asked of you. Right? If somebody asks you to do something you want to do, it's not obedience. You just love doing that. Like, say, you've, you imagine going to some little boy or little girl somewhere and giving them an ice cream and saying, you know, you've just got to eat this. I'm sorry, but you have to eat it. It's not going to be an act of obedience. For some of you, it's going to be you know, given a piece of some chocolate. You know, you've got to eat it. It's, I'm sorry, it's going to be awful for you, but you've got to eat it. And you know better. It's not awful. This is wonderful stuff. Remember my auntie coming to me one time and she gave me sixpence back in those days. I was a little boy. She said, I want you to ride the bike down to the shop and buy yourself an ice cream. I was on the bike and gone like a shot. It's not an obedience issue. I delight to do that. But see, for so many, Christianity is obedience from the day they become born again to the day they die. I've just got to be obedient to God, which shows pretty clearly that I do not want to do generally what's being asked of me. See, Christianity is not about being obedient to God. It's about loving God. The great commandment is not you shall be obedient. That's Old Testament focus. New Testament is love the Lord your God with all your heart, your soul, your mind. I know it's there in the Old Testament. I know it's there in the Ten Commandments. But it becomes real to us in the New Testament and the New Covenant. In being born again, being given a new heart, being transformed out of the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light. Now we walk in love with God. And His purpose in us is to, where we come to the point where we love what He loves. We love doing what He loves doing. We become like him. And his purpose in the final end is that we come in total harmony with who he is in, in our own hearts. And he wants to change our hearts. See, until he changes your heart, you will act out of obedience. But as he changes our hearts, we begin to love what he loves. We begin to become truly sons and daughters. My, my daughter's here at the moment. You know, I, I, I never ask her to be obedient to me now. <laughs> she's more than half my age. She's a, a lot more. <laughs> but 
we didn't raise our children to be obedient to us all their lives. I mean, that's just a part of being a child. But when you grow up, you want them to be like you, to assimilate who you are, to think like you think, to, to believe what you believe, to understand what you understand, to know what you know, to be able to do what you do, to enjoy life like you enjoy it, to be able to be a part of an adult life like you are and become your friend. So it's no longer an issue of obedience, but some Christians live their whole life on this focus of obedience. Let me just say, the love of the Father is transforming Christianity out of servant-hearted focus. It's transforming us out of just being disciples and being disciplined and trying to live a good life through discipline. His love transforms our hearts to begin to become like Him in our hearts. Where, where obedience is no longer an issue, where we would say, like Jesus said, I delight to do your will. Where in our hearts, we begin to feel like Jesus. We say, I always do what pleases him, not out of obedience, but because I love what he loves. I do what pleases him because it's my heart. It pleases me too. So we're in a, we're in a different day today. And I want to, um, I just want to say, when you've lived a Christian life that's been a life focused on obedience and focused on serving and focused on being a servant, and you come into the experience of His love touching your heart, it will change your whole perspective of what it means to be a Christian. It changes our whole walk with God into something else. As, Rich, as Richard was saying before, the, the, the things that we teach in the A school is basically the focus on helping us to come into, make connection with the Father as sons and daughters and begin to experience Him loving us. We know we're taught a lot about the fear of God, which is to honor and respect Him for who He is, but as the time goes on, we come to love him, and love automatically honors. I remember when I was a young man, teenage years, and there was a, my, my best friend's father was an outdoorsman. He worked outside. He worked seven days a week, 12 hours a day, dawn to dark every day, no matter what time of the year it was. He worked dawn to dark. If it was the middle of winter, he'd come home. It was getting dark around 5, 5.30 in the afternoon. He'd work till about 7 or 8 o'clock at night in his, in his garage. He just worked 12-hour days all of his life, seven days a week, all of his life. I greatly admired him. Not because of his hard work, just for the man he was. There's something in me that could not not honor him. He was not always right in what he said, but there was nothing in me that would criticize him about anything because I loved him. And I honored him automatically. See, we, we talk about sometimes today that you even have to learn to make a discipline out of honoring people. If you love, you'll honor automatically. I tell you, I, I honor Denise, my wife. She's the most... Wonderful person. I can't, I can't imagine I could have been married to anybody else. I honor her with everything. I'm so lucky to be married to her. Yeah, I know the Lord put us together and it wasn't luck. But I feel lucky. <laughs> and I honor her. As much as I can. We're coming into a new era of Christendom where the Father is beginning to become, to us, exactly what He was to Jesus. And that's what it means for us to become like Jesus, is to walk with the Father and know the Father, just like Jesus did. Let me, let me just ask this. Let me say, say this. This is a funny thing to say, a stupid thing to say, a dumb thing to say. It's ridiculous. But, you know, we, we want to be like Jesus, right? The problem is, Jesus wasn't like Jesus. Was he? Jesus was like his father. Jesus was the image of his father. So much so that he said, if you've seen me, you've seen the father. He wasn't saying, I am the father. 
He was saying, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. In other words, if you've seen me, you've seen a perfect image of the Father. And so if we're to become like Jesus, just let let it sink into your mind. If we're to become like Jesus, and Jesus was an image of the Father, what does becoming like Jesus really mean? That's probably the Lord calling just to say, listen to this guy. (laughs) We are to become like Jesus. That is the purpose of Christianity. Several times in Ephesians chapter 4, we see that we are to be transformed. The ministry of apostles, prophets, pastors, and teachers and evangelists is there to serve the body of Christ, to transform us into the perfect image of Christ as the body of Christ, that we become just like Jesus. Romans 8 tells us that we are to be transformed into the same image. The Holy Spirit is there to transform us, to change us, to become like Jesus. So our purpose in Christianity as individuals and as a body of people is to become the image of Christ. That is the purpose for us. But the problem is Jesus isn't like Jesus. So what does it mean for us to become like Jesus? See, what it means is that we have the same intimacy with the Father Jesus has, that when people see you and I, they begin to see what the Father is like. There's no other option. I mean, what else can you say? Jesus said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. If we're to become like Jesus, we need to be in a place where people will begin to see the Father in us. You can't be like Jesus by copying what Jesus did. That doesn't make you like him. Like you, You can get a job as a carpenter or something, work with someone building houses, which I've done in my life. And so you can spend your time learning how to build houses exactly like they do it. Hold the hammer the way they hold it. Hit the nail the way they hit it. Do the things that buy, make the same deals with the suppliers that, they, that your boss makes. You can work exactly the same. Learn to hold the, machine, the machinery the same way. To work with the tools exactly the same way. To do it exactly the same way as your boss. But no matter how well you copy him, it doesn't make you like him, does it? It doesn't make you an image of him. Because when he goes home, he goes to his wife and to his children, and they experience him, and they know that he's nothing, you're nothing like him. Not really. You just do stuff like he does it. You just act like he acts. And no matter how much you act like Jesus, it's still just an act. It's not really you. See, Christianity is where we become like Jesus in our hearts. And Jesus' heart was to always please his Father. Jesus' heart was to speak what the Father wanted said and say it exactly the same way the Father would say it. Jesus' heart was to follow what he saw his Father doing for the same reasons his Father did it. And in Jesus' life, we see that his will became the same will as the Father. Not my will, but your will be done, he said. And God is working in us to become like Jesus in that fact of being sons and daughters to the Father, the same way Jesus was and is a son to his Father on earth and through eternity. We become servants in only knowing Jesus. We become disciples in only being filled with the Holy Spirit. But we become sons and daughters when we get filled with the personality of the Father, the love of the Father, the nature of God, which is love being poured into our hearts. We are in a new era of Christianity. You know, some years ago, I remember... um, saying to somebody, I feel like I'm in a river of revelation. I'm seeing things in the scriptures that I've never seen before. Let me just to to explain. Um, From the time I became a Christian when I was 21, nearly 22, I, um, I I just read and read and read and read my Bible. 
I was given a New Testament that had Psalms and Proverbs attached to it, just in a little book. It fitted into my pocket. The first, probably the first four or five months I was a Christian, I must have read that through 14 or 15 times. I just read and read and read and read and read and read. Then I had a, a Bible reading program that took me through the New Testament six times a year and the Old Testament four times. And I just read and read and read and read the Scriptures. Couldn't get enough of it. Because when I would read some of the verses, I felt the presence of the Lord touch my heart again and again and again and again. I've become quite an advocate nowadays of super, super, super slow Bible reading. Trying to get the best out of every little part of it that I can get out of it. There's some, something in me wanted to, to know him. And I learned the word. I learned if somebody had said the Bible says this, I knew whether it said it or not. If somebody misquoted it, I might not be able to know the quote, but I know they've got it wrong. I just became so much, so much focused in my, in my own mind, my own heart. My focus in those days was to be obedient to the Lord and to do everything that he said to me. And I sought his voice to speak to me, to tell me what to do. He, he spoke to me through signs in the skies. He spoke to me through audible voices. I saw his face several times. I, was, I experienced closeness. I, I touched the Lord in so many different ways, so many different times. And every time he'd speak to us, Denise and I would step out and we'd do whatever he said, no matter what the risk to us. There was times when we gave away our beds. We gave away our beds. We gave away our children's beds to people who didn't have one. We trusted the Lord that he'd give us new beds. The people that we gave our beds to didn't have the faith we had. So we thought if we give our beds away, God will give us new ones. But they don't have the faith for that, so we'll give them ours. We gave away cars, we gave away houses, we gave away all the things we had. There was times when we lived with $2 in our wallet. I remember one time we went for months for $2. We were afraid to spend it because then we'd be broke. <laughs> <laughs> then we'd have nothing, and so we were kind of fearful of doing that, just trying to be obedient to everything that the Lord said to us to do. And let me just say to you, those years where we learned a lot of things, but the one thing we didn't learn, we didn't learn to get revelation. We learned the Bible, we learned obedience, we learned discipline, we learned so many different things, but we didn't seem to grow to where we began to understand the mind behind the Bible. We didn't seem to get to the point where we began to understand why the Lord said do this or do that. We knew what he said to do and we did it. We didn't understand the wisdom behind it. Couldn't have written the Bible. No way. It was so it was like, that would be like grasping at the stars. Didn't have any understanding, just be obedient to what it says. I remember asking a person one time after I'd been a Christian for a few weeks, and I said to them, how does it work that Jesus died on the cross 2,000 years ago and he took away my sins that I hadn't even committed yet because I wasn't born? How does it work that my sins were washed away on the cross 2,000 years ago and I hadn't even been here to commit them yet? How, how does that work? This uh, person looked at me with absolute wonderment. I, I thought that this person would know because her parents were Christians, her grandparents were Christians, her great-grandparents were Christians, everybody that she knew. She'd grown up in a Christian church all of her life. She'd grown up amongst Bible-believing, really people who knew the Scriptures very well. I, I thought she would know how that works. It was just a simple question. Like, I just want to understand how it works. How can, you, how can my sins be taken away before I commit them? And she looked at me and I realized in the look in her face that she had never, ever thought of that question ever before in her life. And she just said to me simply, well, just believe it. I said, I do believe it. I just want to understand how it works. Some years ago, I began to feel like the Lord was showing me a lot of, giving me a lot of understanding. I'd read something in the scriptures and I I understand. Now I see. 
When I was at high school, the subject I loved the most was trigonometry. Does anyone here like maths at school? Anyone like particularly trigonometry? I love trigonometry. I just loved learning all the theorems and putting them into actions with these kind of drawings that they'd give us and say, this, you know this angle and that angle, but you've got to work out the length of this piece over here. And so you'd look at it and think, well, what theorems do I put into action? How do I, you know, to get from that known to this unknown, how do I work it out? I love the challenge of it. Still like doing Sudokus and things like that. Just like the challenge of it. And I remember in my, um, in my learning trigonometry, we had this book of um, numbers, seven-figure numbers. Some of you remember those books? And you, no? I learned how to use the book, but I had no understanding what the book was. I didn't know what the numbers were. How did they get the numbers? I didn't know what, how they got the numbers. But somehow, these, if you use these numbers right, you can figure out the answer to a problem just by using the numbers right. But I had no idea where the numbers came from, who put the book together, how they decided which numbers to use. I didn't have any idea of it. Didn't understand the book at all. Just use it. And years later, one time I understood. I, somebody said something to me about those numbers, and I understood it. And then I could have written the book. I know, I could have sat down, it would take me a long time, but I could have sat down, I understood it so well, I could have sat down and I could work out all of those numbers myself, and I never had to worry anymore about the theorems of how you do it, because I understood the basic foundation of what those numbers were for, where they came from, how it works. I knew what's behind it. So many of us as Christians today, we have the Bible, we have the commands, we have the words, and we just see them as things that you have to obey, but we don't understand the mind who wrote them. I just remember saying, I feel like I'm being in a river of revelation, and I had no idea what I was talking about. Why did I feel like I was in a river of revelation? I had no idea. I just began to see things. For example, I saw that Jesus' life as a man was to walk with God as a son. And he perfected his humanity through the things the Father taught him as he was walking with the Father as a man on this earth. And I realized that the purpose of our Christianity is to learn to walk with the Father the same way Jesus did so our humanity gets perfected. I began seeing that Christianity is not about just worshipping and honouring God. It's about understanding God. It's about coming to behind the scenes to know what He's like. I realised that Paul the Apostle, in all of his deep writings, that People have been trying to understand for the last 2,000 years, and even the greatest theologians that the Christ Christian world has put forward still struggle and disagree and argue over the meanings of so many things that Paul wrote. They don't understand what he was getting at. Even this uneducated fisherman, Peter, who struggled with Paul's writings as well, but even some of Peter's writings, some of the great brains of the last 2,000 years have written books about Peter's writings. He was just a fisherman, uneducated, but he wrote stuff that the world has been pondering over, trying to figure out, trying to understand for 2,000 years. How can a fisherman write stuff that the great brains of 2,000 years can't conclusively say he meant this? This is about that. And see, we've turned Christianity into just basically obeying what the Word says or any particular Word. And depending on which denomination we're in, different parts of the Word have different priorities to us. And so we differ in our beliefs of what it's all talking about. But I remember beginning to, to see things I'd never seen before. And I wonder what this river of revelation was about. And I began to understand you see, the one who wrote the Bible is love. God is love. It's not that he has love. It's not that he loves from time to time. He is love. And I began to realize that as we become immersed in that love and experience that love in our hearts more and more, then 
his mind begins to become open to us. I want to read something to you that's changed my life in the last couple of years again. But it's in this, um, it's in this vein. I don't know how, um, I don't know how the time of COVID has affected you, but the lockdowns, but when we, we got back from Korea just the two days or three days before New Zealand locked down, and luckily we just got into the country in time, and uh, suddenly we had to go home, stay home, and we weren't allowed to leave home. Did that happen to you? I, I'm kind of a guy who likes open spaces, and, and, uh, but for the first couple of weeks it was fantastic. I, I remember just being at home. No one was going to knock on the door. No one was going to come and ask if they can come around to us. No one's going to invite us to go for a meal anywhere. No one's going to interfere in our life. Denise and I can just stay here together. Nobody is going to interfere or get in. I can just relax. I'm just one of those people. I'm, I'm not an extrovert. <laughs> For the first couple of weeks, it was wonderful. We just, we just loved it, didn't we, honey? It was, <laughs> it was just the best thing that could happen. But after in the third week, I remember, I started to get a bit bored. And I was taking the dog for a walk one day. We were allowed to go to the nearest park um, and take our dogs for walks, you know, obviously. Um, but we had to um, keep distance away from anyone we met. And so I was coming back from taking the dog for the walk, and I was just so bored. And I said to the Lord this day, I said, Lord, what can I do? Like, I've got to do something. And he just spoke to my heart, and it was total surprise. He said, um, you could write about wisdom if you like. And I thought, wisdom? I don't know anything about wisdom. <laughs> like, I can't write about wisdom. I don't know anything about wisdom. And, but it was kind of an exciting thing to me, but I thought, what, what can I do? It would never have occurred to my mind to, to think that. And so I thought, well, I don't know anything about wisdom, so how can I write about it? Well, the next morning or the morning after, I'm not sure, I woke up and my mind was buzzing, and a scripture that I'd read and never really noticed, I'd read it so many times, and I'd never really tried to memorize anything in it, I was never hit by anything in, this ver in these verses. It didn't make a big impression on me. I, I'd never, you know, stopped there and thought about it. It's just these verses came back to my mind. I realized, you know, if, if you read your scriptures over and over and over again, what will happen is that God then can begin to bring it back to you in times when you need to know. And so this verse, and it was from Proverbs chapter 2, and I want to read some of this to you because this has changed my understanding of Christianity again. It's like a part of the river of revelation. I've begun to see something that I want to try to share with you. And I don't know if I can share this or not, but I want to try. Proverbs chapter 2, Solomon is speaking to his son. And Solomon is considered to be one of the wisest men who ever lived. Been a lot of wise men in history. He's purported to be one of the wisest men who ever lived. And he says this. He says, my son, my son, if you receive my words. It's interesting that he says, my son. The wisdom is passed on father to son. So many times, and I'm sure some of you have had it, you say, one thing I always remember my father saying. How many of you have ever said that in your life? One thing I remember my father saying to me. And it was a word of wisdom, perhaps, and it's appropriate that fathers say this to their sons and say these things to their sons and daughters. Wisdom is generally passed on father to sons. And we see that Jesus is the wisdom of God in scriptures. The wisdom of God is encapsulated in the person of Jesus Christ. Jesus is the Word of God. He's the Logos of God. He carries all of the knowledge of God. He's the wisdom of God in all things because He's God's Son and the Father shares His wisdom with His sons. And in the ideal picture we see of God the Father and Jesus, we see that the Father passed on wisdom to His Son. The Son became the expression of the wisdom of God to us. And so Solomon 
starts off this part talking about wisdom. He said, My son, if you receive my words and treasure my commands within you. See what, see what he's starting to say? He's starting to talk to his son saying, Son, I, I want to have an impartation into your life. I want to give something to you that's going to be tremendously valuable. If you will receive my words, if you listen to what I say, if you treasure my commands within you so that you incline your ear to wisdom and apply your heart to understanding. He's talking to his son saying, son, I want you to become wise. I want you to incline your ear to me. I want you to listen to me. I want you to grow in wisdom. I want you to become a wise son. And so he's saying, if you will treasure my commands, incline your ear to wisdom, if you'll apply your heart to understanding. Yes, if you cry out for discernment, if you lift up your voice for understanding, if you seek her as silver and search for her as for hidden treasures. He's, he's, he's encouraging his son, son, I want you to become wise, and if you will apply your heart to this, if you will apply your mind, if you will turn your ear, if you will open your heart to wisdom, if you will try to discover discernment, if you will try to discover understanding, if you will cry out for it and seek it, he says, then you will understand the fear of the Lord. If you'll do these things, you'll understand the fear of the Lord. And then this verse, and find the knowledge of God. You know, I, I'd read that so many times. I don't know how many times I'd read that before this. But suddenly I realized what Solomon was saying. He's basically saying God is the source of all wisdom. And if you will cry out for it, if you will apply your ear to listen to wisdom, if you will open your heart to try to understand, not just know, understand. It's one thing to know something. I knew how to use the logarithm book. I had no idea to understand it. He said, if you will cry out to understand. If I had have understood what those numbers in that book were, I would have found trigonometry so much easier. I would have been able to throw out all of the theorems because I understand the whole system behind how the theorems became true, why they were true. And he's saying, Solomon's saying to his son, son, if you will cry out for wisdom, what he's finally saying is, you will discover what God knows. You will become, begin to think the way God thinks. I had never, ever, until this point, just a few years ago, I'd never, ever considered that it was possible to begin to think the way God thinks. You know, the Lord says, my ways are higher than your ways. As high as the heavens are above the earth are my ways above your ways. He says, you are of this world. I am not of this world. We have been educated in all of the things of this world. Jesus was not. He was educated in the heart of his Father. He was educated in the wisdom of God that has been there before the universe was even created. Jesus carried the wisdom of the ages, of millennia, prior to the universe being created. Jesus was there in the very beginning. The wisdom that God knew, the things that God understood, the things that had become eternal perspective to God before mankind was even made, before the universe was made, the values, the issues of how God thinks and how he feels and why he does what he does was established millennia, thousands, millions of years before the earth was even created, before the universe existed. It's the wisdom of the ages past. And God was established in that understanding way, way back in time before we even had a chance to sin. Before this world even began to exist. The things that God understood and knew and was settled on and was established in the ways of thinking of God from way back there before there was even a possibility of humans being alive. Jesus is steeped, established, and founded in that knowledge. He knows how God thinks. And what Solomon is saying here is if we will seek for wisdom. See, I don't believe that wisdom, the real wisdom of God, has been available to us in the body of Christ over the last 
many hundreds of years because we've thought that Christianity is about being a servant and just doing what we're told. But as soon as we begin to understand it's about being sons and dwelling in his love and dwelling in his nature and becoming like him in heart, then he can share with us the understanding of the wisdom of the ages going way back to time immemorial. Time past, way back, that we can begin. He said, if you will cry out for this as a son, my son, he says, if you will cry out for this wisdom, if you will want to understand, if you will want to know how come your sins have been taken away before you even were born, they've been washed away and the, 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 the provision is already made, it's already done, and it's cleansing is there for you before you were even born. If you want to really understand how that is, then you've got to come into the nature and the love of the Father, dwell in His heart as a son and as a daughter, and then He can begin to share with us the way He thinks. I never considered that. You see, because we haven't had the wisdom of God, we've just been obedient to the Word. I remember as a young Christian, somebody preached one time, and they, and they, they kind of said, um, you know, that scripture that says, um, Israel knew the acts of God, but Moses knew God's ways. And we thought we knew God's ways because we could speak in tongues. <laughs> we thought we knew God's ways because we knew that his ways were physical healing. God's ways were casting out demons. God's ways were words of knowledge, were words of wisdom, was prophecy. God's ways, as we were thinking, were these kind of things. But, you know, the ways of God is not prophecy. That's an act. The ways of God come out of his nature. The ways of God are all wrapped up in meekness and kindness and gentleness. God's ways are governed by his nature. And when, I was, when I was a young man, I wanted to live without people in my life. <laughs> I had two things that were very significant about my life. One of them was I had no relationship with my father, and I was an incredibly lost young man. The other was I didn't want to have anything to do with people in my life. I was very afraid that if I gave my life to the Lord, he'd make me spend my life with people. (laughs) It was one of the big issues of giving my life to Christ, to make me spend my life with people. (laughs) And the strange thing is, I now help people to come into their relationship with God as their father. I help people to come to know their father, to receive his love and to love their fathers their father. I spend my life helping people to forgive their earthly mothers and fathers for all the stuff that's gone on in their, in their past and to come to know God as our father. I spend my life with people all over the world. I don't even, you know, I'm really sorry that sometimes I just don't remember people because I just, my, my I think there's a number of people you can remember and then your mind just goes <laughs> and you almost forget everybody. God is such a father to us. He is leading us to become like Jesus. We thought that we knew what the ways of God were. When I was a young teenager, I, got a, I, I developed a goal. You, you won't understand this probably in Singaporean life or any Asian life probably at all. But New Zealand is closer to a pioneering country. And it's... Um, I think the whole of Singapore fits into the lake outside our back door. Um, New Zealand's quite big, but um, there's only five million people in New Zealand, and most of them live in Auckland in the the north. So anywhere south of that, there's not many people. There's huge areas of New Zealand where no one lives. Two-thirds of the country is mountains. And um, I heard that there are hunters that lived in the mountains, and um, they were employed by the government just to, to shoot the, the wild animals there to keep the numbers down because they were destroyed. All the mammals in New Zealand have been imported. 
And so they just destroy the nature. They, there's no predators being imported, but all the deer and pig, wild pigs and goats and things like that, they just grow in numbers so fast. They destroy the forests on the, on the mountains, destroy the whole mountains. And massive landslides occur, and the mountains just get destroyed. And the government wanted to try to, to hold that back, so they employed young men to live in the mountains and just shoot deer all day, every day. And I decided I wanted to live in the mountains by myself and do that. And so when I um, was 17, I was old enough, and they employed me and, uh, with my rifle and a pack and a sleeping bag. I wandered off into the mountains and began to shoot deer for the government. I met a guy there who was an amazing hunter. You know, this is probably something you wouldn't understand, perhaps. But I met this guy there that was this incredible hunter. We used to joke about Jim, his name was. It's one of the reasons why I don't want anyone else to call me Jim, even though my name's James. I don't want to be called Jim. Um, somebody tried it once, and they've gone to be with the Lord now, but. <laughs> but Jim was an amazing hunter, and, and he would go hunting for a day. I remember one day he went hunting, and he came back with 23 deer he'd shot in a day. Absolutely extraordinary. The most I ever got was five. I didn't know anybody else that had shot more than five. Jim would get 16 some days, he'd go and get 12. Just He'd go into a little patch of bush, which you wouldn't even ever see a deer foot, footprint in, and he'd come out with eight deer tails. It was just amazing. And I wanted to be like Jim. I wanted to be able to hunt like him. He was amazing. I wanted to be like him. I tried to be like him. I, I talked to him, How do you get, where do you go? He'd tell me where the deer are, how to find them, where to go, and I would go where he said and I'd find them. But when I didn't see him for a while, I didn't know where they were. It wasn't until many years later, in fact, only four or five years ago today, I was talking to Jim, and uh, he's older now, he's nearly 80. I was talking to him, and um, as I was talking to him, I realized something about Jim that I didn't know. He loved the trees and the plants of the mountains. He absolutely loved everything about the fauna the nature of the trees and the plants and everything was there. And so for him, when he went hunting, he didn't go hunting deer. He went looking for deer food. He went where the deer food was. And of course, that's where the deer were. And he knew every plant. He knew when they would be flowering or when it would be at different stages of the plant's life. He knew when the deer are not interested in eating those anymore at the moment because they're sour. It's, it's the wrong time of the year. They'll be in this place. So he could just look at a great, great big area of mountains. You know, there'll be deer there, there, and over here. You just go to those three places and get seven or eight deer. And I would wander through all of the other stuff, hour after hour after hour, and there's no deer there. And I, he understood deer. I didn't understand. I just knew that if you walk in the mountains, sometimes you come across them. When you see them, you just point the rifle at them, pull the trigger. It's very simple. I didn't understand Jim's ways. I just understood how to shoot the rifle. You see, we've, we've walked with God not understanding his ways. And so what we've done is we've just tried to be obedient to the few words we do understand and try to please him in some way instead of getting involved in the understanding that he has of what life is about, what God is, who he is, what he thinks about, what he understands, what he knows. And see, as we come to understand what he understands and what he knows and how he feels and we understand his ways, then we can read the scriptures and it will mean a whole different thing to us. We begin to see things we never saw before because now we understand his ways. See, one of the ways of God is that he is meek. We want to talk sometime about humility in the next few days. The humility of God. He is far more... You know, humility is his way. It's just the way he lives his life. It's the way he is. His way is gentleness. His way is kindness. His way is the absolute appreciation of beauty. And he's created beauty all over the world. It's obviously his ways. And he wants us to become so involved and appreciative and, and, and wrapped up in the issue of the creation of beauty to turn the whole of this world into a garden 
Singapore is well down the way. But these are his ways. We come to understand his ways. As we come to understand his ways, then we know what it is that how 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 to walk this life. See, I don't know if I can wrap this together or tie this together for what I'm trying to say. But you see, so long as we're just seeing God as one who gives us commands to be obedient to, then we're gonna we're gonna hit and miss what he's really looking for in our life. We won't even know when we hit it and we won't know when we miss it because we just think being obedient is the issue of Christian life. Being disciplined is the issue of Christian life. Trying to do morally what is right and, and rejecting what is immorally or wrong, immoral or wrong. Just think if we keep doing what, is what we believe is right, the trouble is that every denomination has a different priority system on what's right and what's wrong. So your understanding of doing what is right is totally dependent on what you've been taught. But as we begin to understand who God is, and it comes from sonship, because he shares his nature with his sons and daughters. And it's not just about doing what is, we've been told to do, becoming you know, servant robots to become like him. And then the finally, and I just want to end by saying this, if I can say it well. As we become individually absolutely infused with his nature, each one of us, we will not need any form of government over us as nations or as uh, internationally. As we become infused with the very nature of God himself, then that nature will be the same in each and every one of us. Our personalities will be different. Our giftings and talents will be different. But our nature will be in total harmony, every one of us with each other. And there will be no need for anybody to be like a president or a prime minister or, or a, whatever we call it, a king or princes. Or, there will be no need for any of that because everything that we do will be totally in harmony with everything that every one of, every, the rest of us do. And I'll only be able to love and bless you. There'll be nothing in any of our hearts to take anything from any. We'll all be wanting to bless each other more that there will come, as C.S. Lewis called, this great dance of humanity. Where every human being filled with the very nature of God, becoming partakers of the nature of God. See, that's what the body of Christ means, that the whole body has the same nature together. It's not a physical body like we'd see a physical body. My body moves in harmony with my heart and with my mind. My, it moves in harmony with what I'm saying. My arm does this when I'm saying something because it's a part of who I am. And as I express something, my body does what it needs to express it. My mouth says what my heart and my mind are trying to say. It moves all as one in a perfect harmony. And that's going to happen in the body of Christ as the single nature of God becomes the foundation of every single one of us. We'll move like this great, dance of humanity that will be totally involved in the blessing and the expansion and, the, and the, the progress, if you like, into greater and greater beauty and art and perfection, joy and peace and kindness will just flow from the whole body towards each other. And there'll be no need for military. There'll be no need for all the things that today we try to protect ourselves with, this great, incredible dance. And what do we call this? We call it the kingdom of God where he is the king, but he's not the king up there sitting on a throne. He's the king of all of our hearts. And he is one with us, that the whole family of humanity begin to flow together in this incredible oneness without anybody needing to tell anybody what to do because our own hearts will not be able to do anything other than be a blessing to everyone else. Finally, I understand what the kingdom of God is. You see, I, I, I believe that in this 
whole revelation of sonship. This is why it's so, so, so important for us. It's so important what Father Heart Ministries is doing. It's so important. These A schools and B schools that we run are so important because they're the doorway for us to come in to begin to experience the Father's love for us the same way Jesus walked in it and lived it himself. And as that love grows in us and grows in us, then we'll begin to understand our Father, we'll begin to have the wisdom of God, begin to think like God thinks, begin to act without, by nature, not by any choices. People say, you know, you've got to make good choices. Oh, <laughs> he's, he's, he's changing our hearts to want to be like him yes. automatically. Yes. Yes. And as that begins to happen, the kingdom of God is going to just take over. When the kingdom of God begins to arise in a few people's hearts, it's going to slowly, quickly, it's going to expand throughout the whole family of the body of Christ, and the world is going to look at it and say, look how they love each other. Yeah. It's a new day. We didn't, I didn't understand when Jack Winter first began to preach to us about experiencing the love of the Father, I had no idea where it was heading. It seemed like, and there's still people who think like this, that the Father's love is one portion of the body of Christ. It's one subject to be preached. It's one thing on the side. It's kind of like a funny little group of people who focus on the love of the Father. It's the central, foundational, basic of everything. It says, For God so loved the world that He gave His Son to bring us home. It's a new day. I, I, I believe in another 50 years we're going to see Christianity turned upside down, back to front, inside out, and it's going to begin to walk on its head. I don't care what it's going to do, but it's going to be different. It's an appropriate response. <laughs> see, people want to be free. We don't want to be ruled. We want to be free. We want to follow our hearts. But most of our things in our hearts, there's things in our hearts we should not follow. Right? But it's not until you experience the Father's love for you beginning to take over your heart that then we'll be able to follow our hearts in absolute freedom and that nobody will tell us what to do because all of us will know him from the least of us to the greatest and we'll all walk with him. And this what C.S. Lewis saw as the great dance of humanity where we're dancing in the same nature that God has in himself. Yeah, well, I think it's kind of exciting. As Forrest Gump says, that's about all I have to say about that. <laughs> so, put one hand on your head with me. I did this someplace and somebody said, the Bible doesn't say you're allowed to lay hands on yourself. <laughs> We're not laying our hands on ourselves. It's my hand, it's my head, I can do what I like. <laughs> Pray this with me. Heavenly Father, I thank you that you are loving me right now. Father, I've gone through so many years of my life feeling unloved, rejected, purposeless, hopeless, and lost. Father, I thank you that you know me. You know everything about me, and you have a future for me beyond my understanding. I'm going to live with you forever, but not only with you. I'm going to live in you, and you're going to live in me. And the oneness that you have with Jesus is mine, and I walk into it today. Father, I ask you that you'd pour your love into my heart when I'm asleep at night, when I'm awake in the morning, when I'm driving on the road, when I'm at work, when I'm praying, when I'm not praying, <laughs> when I'm at church, when I'm not at church, when I'm with my family, when I'm angry and upset, <laughs> when I'm lost and disappointed, every moment of every day, Father, I thank you 
that you don't stop loving me. You don't lose your purpose for me. You don't lose your focus on me. You don't lose your interest with me. Even when I do things wrong, you've provided for that in the blood of Jesus. And I am yours, and you are mine. And nobody can take this away from me. If nobody can take this away from me, you are my father. And I am your son. I'm your daughter. I'm your friend. I thank you that you're my friend and that I am with you for the rest of eternity. Father, start the music and let the dance begin. That the kingdom of God may come. In Jesus' name, Father. Yeah. Yes. Let's stand up for a moment. I'm going to ask you to do something you've probably never been, never been asked to do in a Christian meeting. I want you to turn to somebody and shake their hand and say, welcome to the family. Father, I pray that right across this room, you'll begin to move our hearts into sonship, that you'll bring us home into your love, Father. Father, we ask that you would teach us to walk as Jesus walked, in your love as sons and daughters. And Father, to turn this world, this Christianity upside down, so that we can know you as sons and daughters for the rest of eternity. In Jesus' name, Father. Now give them a hug. God bless you. Thank you for coming. Some of you are going to wake up in the middle of the night, maybe tonight or tomorrow night or a week's time or a month's time, and suddenly it's going to be like the light goes on. You realize what's happened here tonight. God bless you. Why don't you uh, give as many people as you feel like you can a hug before you leave the room realize that this is our family.